Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 795. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is March 17th, 2023. All right, you're watching another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. We are glad we have people who watch us. Otherwise, this would be kind of a, a fruitless <laughs> endeavor where George and I would sit in front of our webcams and talk about all things news around the world. Um, when I first uh, did our pre-show with George, this is how it started. <coughs> George, still got that, that hoarse throat you're going on there. How are you doing today? I'm getting better. I've been, been ill with a cold for about a week, but uh, it's passing away quickly and can't wait to get fully back into the swing of things absolutely um we're doing well here we are uh, t minus i think uh two and a half weeks before we leave florida and start our our summer travels spring travels and uh uh get the sasquatch on the road again so we've been here in dry dock getting things fixed up and uh ready for the road that's going to be fun and exciting i think we have a uh 18 uh, site destination 18 different places we're going to go uh, until we get here next October be kind of crazy uh, but keep uh, informed if you want to follow us uh, as we travel I have a Facebook page we use it's called pretending we are retired and I have a link to it in the show notes so you can follow the adventures of Kevin Jill and Sasquatch George let's move on to the news because even though I think it's kind of a slow news week we got a lot of stories here um, if you don't know, then you should, because we referred to it in, our, in the last couple of shows, there was a drag show at a church in the Church of England. No surprise there. <laughs> when I saw it, I was not surprised. Uh, George probably wasn't very surprised at all either. However, a clergy person who's a friend of the show has filed disciplinary measures against Lucy uh, Winkett for hosting this drag show in her church. What's the story there, George? Well, we, we spoke last time about uh, St. James Piccadilly in a very nice part of London, mm -hmm. which hosted a drag show. Now, I, confl I made a mistake. I conflated. There was also a drag show in Southend-on-Sea that was focused towards children, and that uh, caused a ruckus at the same time, and that caused the bishop to speak to the uh, vicar there and say, no, 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 you can't do that for kids. The St. James Piccadilly wasn't meant for children. It actually, they sold tickets, 10 up to 40 pounds, to see uh, cabaret-type performers uh, dressed as women doing uh, song and dance and the sort of risque things they do in the sanctuary of St. James Piccadilly. Well, it was pretty shocking, nonetheless. Uh, rather tame, I'm told. Uh, as these things go in the cabaret world at Soho, which is just around the corner from St. James Piccadilly. Mm -hmm. But a priest uh, of the Church of England has filed a CDM, a clergy disciplinary measure, against the uh, vicar of St. James, Lucy Winkett. And he has raised two points. Canon F. Uh, 15 says the church may not used, a, may not be profaned. You may not have strip shows or uh, things that uh, profane the gospel that cause uh, ex uh, cause scandal. And Canon F-16 says you may have, you know, plays and concerts and musicals and things of that nature in the church, but they must be edifying, meaning they must be improving. They may not be, you cannot host uh, uh, pole dancing or strippers. Uh, <laughs> the, the giant in monologues, you can't have that either. <laughs> well, probably not. And the issue is, the first, has uh, the Bishop of London's disciplinary proceedings, well, she'll get this, the Bishop of London will get this, uh, you know, through the Archdeacon, and they'll decide whether it's a prima facie case, and so either the Bishop of London will throw it out immediately, or let it be adjudicated. And the question is, is our drag shows edifying? It, do, do they profane a church? And we need to take the children side out of it. That mm -hmm. is pure satanic, demonic, and whatnot. Uh, having you know men dressed as women doing uh, 
mimicking sexual acts and things of that nature with lewd and lascivious language in front of small children. And anyway, uh, I don't think that can be defended. And I no. can't think that to be defended on any level. No. Here the question is, can a one without kitties present, but still with the innuendo and all this and that, and the uh, all, all the froth, does I would that say, profane well, a Christian church? As a Christian, I think in a sanctuary, hell yeah, it does profane it. I think for mm -hmm. certain that the, the, there is a, a way here that um, once you've hit a point where it's not appropriate for children, you've crossed the line. You've gone from P to PG, and uh, there's uh, PG is defaming uh, a sanctuary, George, in my opinion. Well, the... Uh this will be decided by a court in the Church of London, or the Bishop of London will throw it out on its face. And it's not just drag shows. We had another cathedral, I think it was, was it Salisbury Cathedral? Another cathedral recently held, had uh, movies with uh, sexual content in them. Uh, not merely just R-rated movies, but movies that have, you know, a bit more. Sure. I don't... I don't know what the rating system is anymore these days, and it's different in the UK than it is in the US. I haven't been to a movie in several years, so there you, uh, there you go. Yeah. But the uh, but is the culture so debased, Western culture so debased that anything goes, anything whatsoever goes, um, or can Which anything any goes is a Broadway show from the fifties. Uh, so yeah, I mean. Who knows? Well, the, the, but the, the point being is, at what point it has the church lost its sacred or holy character? Yeah. And it's merely an exhibition hall. And at that point, uh, has that been reached at St. James Piccadilly, where it really has lost its charism of holiness, a place where God is worshipped and revered? And is it just another venue? in uh just off of soho in london well we've talked about this probably four or five times in the last you know 10 years um the church of england and many people who attend the church of england churches look at it differently than we do here in the evangelical west uh in north america many people in the church of england think of it no differently than they think of a public library uh, a place where you get your baptisms, you get your marriages, you attend your funerals, and certain holidays. And I was talking uh, to Gerald Bray about uh, this in an interview. He says, uh, Kevin, you, you, you're confused about how much uh, your regular Church of England uh, layperson thinks about the Church of England. And they don't hold it in, into the steam that we hold it in North America. And you can see that when you have drag shows in sanctuaries and uh, beyond rated R movies in sanctuaries where you have, you, you're fighting against the holiness that is present. And I, I just like, he's right. Gerald, I'm quoting you years after our interview. Um, the, the average attender of the Church of England thinks of their church differently than I do. So it is correct to say well, we that. Have well, we have that problem in the United States, and actually it seems that the craziest right now are the Methodists, the liberal United Methodist Church. They're yeah. doing the drag shows. They're doing uh, all this dress-up stuff. Uh, we, we still have our crazies in the Episcopal Church. Usually that takes a place, though, of clown Eucharists, which actually I think are quite demonic. But uh, there Was it that go. Trinity Wall Street? Um, where, where, where did they do that? Trinity Wall Street, yes. Yeah. Trinity Wall Street did it, and... Mm. Um, now, there's a type of clergy person who usually likes to shock and be daring and transgressive. But that is so... I'm, we're 50, 60 years past the point where having, a, having a, something lewd at the church shocks people. Mm -hmm. All it does is just reinforce the popular impression among many... Um, the popular impression that most churches are dead, spiritually dead. And oh, uh, they should that, have turned into. 
<laughs> that's a story further down. We'll talk about a poll that was conducted. All right, so let's move on to our next story. It includes Martin Percy, who used to be the uh, Dean of Christ Church College of the Oxford Diocese. He was kicked out. Yeah, I would say kicked out, forced out. Uh, we learn now that it took five million pounds to rid Christ Church College of the Dean Martin Percy. And I don't know about you, but that's a lot of money, George. Well, academics fights are the most intense because they have the least consequences. They're just mm -hmm. pure pettiness. And one group at Christ Church College of the Fellows wanted to get rid of Martin Percy because of personal animosities. Mm -hmm. And they spent almost five million pounds and essentially frivolous and fraudulent legal cases eventually to get him to go away, including a settlement. Well, the Diocese of Oxford and Christ Church College put out a press release, first woman dean of Christ Church, ooh, ah, gush, gush, gush. Professor Sarah Foote, who was one of the four canon theologian at the, at the cathedral. Well, canon Foote was intimately involved in the campaign to get rid of Martin Percy and was part of the group uh, whose evidence was reviewed by the uh, Charity Commission, basically found that, you know, it was self-interested. And so this is just a bad appointment on many levels. And it's not just George saying this, and I'm not saying it from a pol theological, political level. Martin Sewell, who's an advocate for uh, the abused and the Church of England's General Synod, called this an own goal where one of the pe one of the troublemakers, one of the instigators, one of the people who wasted five million pounds uh, is being rewarded by getting the top job. Who is making these choices? Uh, it, it, bad, you know, it, just like we had uh, Bishop Burkert, uh, former Bishop of Birmingham, uh, elevated to be Bishop to the Archbishops, and he's got two safeguarding penalties against him. Yeah. Plus, he lives with his boyfriend. Uh, now we have uh, Professor Foote elevated to the dean of Christ Church when she's been tagged for wasting college money on a personal animosity and spite. Is there something now to be elevated in the Church of England that you really have to have some sort of moral character or defect or flaw? No, I, I think... You are very correct in saying that, and but we've watched it before. This is no more surprising to me than seeing drag queens in a sanctuary in the Church of England. Yeah, this is the hypocrisy we see. This is, you know... Yeah, I, why do we even report on this? It's so common. Yeah. Oh, we're moving on to our third Church of England story in a row, George. Flying Bishop Rob Monroe says... Uh, the, uh, in, in regards to what we're doing with LLF, we need to stand firm in our witness and witness to the bishops. Yeah, but in, in, in my <coughs> world order, bishops have more power than your average uh, 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 priest, George. They have secular power. Uh, spiritual power, that's a totally different conversation. Right. Uh, Julian Mann, one of the correspondents at Anglican Inc., wrote an op-ed piece pointing out that Bishop Monroe is whistling past the graveyard, is an American phrase of basically saying, la, 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 I can't hear you, let's make enough noise so as to distract from the real issue. Bishop Monroe is saying that we need to pray for these default uh, bad bishops. Uh, what do we do if we're out of fellowship with them? Uh, well, we pray for them and we continue being good and faithful Christians. Well, as Julian Mann points out, these people, these fellas, these men, these women still have disciplinary power over you. So in essence, I, they, when they say jump, you have to say how high. And you st at the, that this is well, wishful thinking. It's ignoring the hard realities of the Church of England. And the point has long been passed where you can take the promises of a bishop on trust. Oh, absolutely. Um, hey, prime example, mutual flourishing. I mean, if Bishop, Flying Bishop Rod Monroe had said this 
15 years ago that listen we just need to trust this flying bishop or trust mutual flourishing and trust and witness to the bishops that this is the way forward that there could be two integrities when it comes to uh women's orders it'll work just fine but it didn't because there was no reason to trust the other side the other side wanted to be sure that you did not win and that they slowly weeded out conservatives from conservative parishes and conservatives from conservative um, dioceses. We saw that here in America as well, that a uh, if you appointed a sub-moderate or liberal bishop, he would slowly weed out the conservatives from the conservative parishes so that they, they lose that voting power. And that's one way they have the secular influence, not just over priests, but over the politics of the entire diocese, George. The... Bishop Helen Ann Hartley, who is uh, the new bishop of Newcastle in England, uh, she's one of these people who have been promoted basically because they represent uh, a token class. Uh, and she's not particularly impressive theologically, intellectually, academically, but she's well connected. And she served as a bishop in New Zealand for a while. And she's now proposing that clergy in the Diocese of Newcastle um, be treated like employees of the bishop, meaning at-will employees, that we call them in the United States, hire and fire at will. Mm -hmm. That if the bishop doesn't like you, she can pull her license and you can't serve in that diocese. Even if you have a, have, have a cure or a, or a parish or something. In other words, the protections of parish, of the, the freeholder, the parish ministry, which have been cut down dramatically by General Synod in recent years and in the name of efficiency and trying to weed out bad apples. The power mad people are using it like Bishop Helen and Hartley to consolidate power so that there is no need for a flying bishop in Newcastle because there will be no dissenters allowed because you'll need her license whether you agree or not with what she says, and if you don't agree with her, well, you may want to think about not applying for a job in that diocese, or if you're there, to leave. Um, this is, for many of these people, it seems more about power and promotion, self-promotion, than it does in being a servant to the servant of God, servants of God. Um, one of the, I think, the great failings of the modern age of the church and I would say it's across much of the Anglican world, is the failure of the episcopacy to have a purpose. Are they administrators? Are they fathers in God? Are they chief liturgical officers? What are they? Because the Episcopal Church, or at least my part of the Episcopal Church, bishops are necessary evils, that, you, that you, they're like the government. You pay taxes to them and hope they stay as far away as possible. Right, but they because... add nothing. They do, they, to the, and they to don't. The life of the parish. They don't have your back. Oh, they're yeah. not. Yeah, they're not there to support your ministry. They're there to support their ministry, their ideas, their agenda, and their administration. And so many times uh, in the Episcopal Church, the Lutheran Church, um, I hear stories where uh, the the further away I am from my bishop, the better it is for me. Um, yeah. And I, you, you have the same uh, witness about your bishop. Yeah, and and it's it's a it's a case of uh, the relationship of a priest to a pastor. You know, I have their back. How are you doing? I want to know. I want to know how they're doing. How can I pray for them? Where are they in their spiritual walk? I'm not there to condemn them, but to love them and to help them. And when I was young, I assumed the relationship of a bishop to a priest was the same way. How can he help me in my ministry? How can he strengthen me in my spiritual walk? In 25, 30 years, that's never been the case. Never been the case. And I'm not talking about liberal versus conservative bishops. I'm mm. talking about any bishop I've ever had in the Episcopal Church or the Church of England. They do not, they have not seen their job as caring for George. There's no uh, nothing in their job description that says to be pastor to their clergy. But, and in the same way, they don't hold each other accountable. 
uh, in the mm-hmm. Episcopacy around the world, uh, I don't see a lot of accountability within uh, denominational grounds. Uh, Church of England, Episcopal Church, Canada, uh, and I, I can name them all, I suppose. There's just this unwillingness to call somebody else out uh, at, in their episcopacy when they're doing something wrong or marginally wrong, and that's going to set and, up for failure. Well, there's a the, the Bishop of Warrington uh, in the Church of England. It's a woman. Um, she's one of these women who, of a certain age, who dresses younger uh, than she is biologically. And it comes off as really jarring when you see her. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that's that's unfair. I shouldn't. Have said it is. That. I try to dress you. Why? I don't know. What are you saying? You know. Well, there is some dignity in being a bishop, I think, but yes, some people don't see that. Well, no. she's she's she has these little viral. She has these little rants where she talks about sin, mm-hmm. and the thing is, she's condemning sin, and then going around promoting a different type of sin and in other words so that if you so that like let's say you're one of her if i were one of her clergy i would hear her going on and on about power inequalities and things like that and then she's promoting gay marriage what how can i take her seriously as someone who has no concept of what sin is because it's well, certainly no. not connected to what the bible says she is uh, part of the the john lennon gospel uh, which we talked about in many episodes before, where she belongs to a man-made church, church in the image of man. So sin is climate change. Sin is, uh, you know, not having wealth re- retri- uh, wealth d- distribution. Sin is not having socialism. Sin, you know, sin is not having equality. That's that's man's church, the church made in the image of man. The church that we know made in the, the image of God to worship God is much different. And we understand uh, sin to be something that separates us from God. She looks at something as sin is that something separates you from Mother Nature and something that separates you from society. And when you have church leaders like that, in America, in the UK, in Australia, and in other places, Canada, you you ask yourself, what really connection do they have to the living Lord Jesus that I know, and who to whom I have given my life? Because what they're talking about, this is almost interfaith rather than uh, discussions. I mean, they're talking about a different God. I mean, Gene Robinson used to talk about the gay bishop of New Hampshire, my God, my God, my God, and it didn't really bother me because his God was totally unlike anything my God was like. He was worshiping God in Gene's image. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it really didn't bother me like that. But then when people hold themselves out to be the foundation stone, the touchstone, the, uh, the faith that has been handed down in an unbroken line from the apostles, and I can't connect the faith that I read about and see in the gospels and in the book of acts and in the patristic fathers with that faith being promulgated by uh our modern day masters in purple what's going on here um, yeah. george carey a number of years ago 90s i think it was 98 98 said that we are at a time where the at uh, and great is great in the church life as the reformation uh 500 years ago and at the time people scoffed at george carey but I think he's absolutely right. I think we are at that so almost time of epic-making, denomination-changing, world-changing groups. I have more in common with uh, conservative Catholics and conservative Lutheran Methodists, uh, uh, conservative uh, Missouri Lutherans, mm-hmm. than I do with most many Episcopalians. Um, and many Episcopalians have more in common with liberal Catholics in Germany and the United States than they do with the. Uh, people like me and the boonies i would say have more in common with pagans but okay if you want to you know <laughs> just do other denominations that's fine but here we german had, german catholics pagans i think kevin we can interchange those we, we, yes absolutely <laughs> you know and that's why i always say that uh the episcopal church and now the church of england have become ecumenical at best in their relationship with the anglican communion 
that they are somebody you recognize who's outside of the Anglican communion because they're practicing some pagan type uh, liturgies and ideas and theology. Oh, but we didn't change our prayer book. Well, pff, so what? You're, you're still practicing the wrong thing. And um, so we're at that point now where we have a topic that's the oldest topic in Christendom, I think. We're moving on to talk about Holy Communion. And there was a recent uh, meeting in the West Indies. And this is a, an interesting topic. I mean, if you think about Holy Communion, we've always talked within church, who gets to serve the, uh, perform and serve the, the Holy Communion? Well, a priest, if you're uh, Anglican and Roman Catholic. And uh, I guess there has been some suggestion that we have the lay presidency um, from Australia, our good friends down in Sydney. But other than that, a priest is to perform the Eucharist. We've moved on to include uh, women's orders in that as well, uh, here in Anglicanism. And then the question is, well, as far as main denominations, what really happens at the Eucharist? Is Jesus really, 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 really there? Um, or is it real presence? Or is this just symbolic? Now we're talking about uh, something that we've had here the last 40 or 50 years in the Episcopal Church and Anglicanism. Do you need to be confirmed to receive Holy Communion? And this is a topic they were talking about in the West Indies. George, it's a big topic. Yeah, I hold a license from the Bishop of Northeastern Caribbean and uh, Aruba, so mm -hmm. I'm mildly aware of this. But uh, when I serve in the West Indies, you must be confirmed before you can receive Holy Communion at a West Indian church, Anglican church. Uh, that was the rule up and as I was a child growing up, you had to be confirmed to receive Holy Communion. And then we had sort of the gradual liberalization of the rules so that there are some parishes where the priest requires you to be confirmed. There are other parishes that uh, there's no requirement uh, and it's up to the parent whether their child receives. And then there are every so often at Episcopal General Conventions, we'll get resolutions from places out west saying, well, we should allow people who aren't baptized to receive communion so that they feel welcomed in the church. Sure. Well, so far the bishops have shot all those down. For nine years, the church in the West Indies, their synod has been debating, do we make baptism the gateway to Holy Communion or do we maintain confirmation as the gateway to Holy Communion? What do we understand to be the right of confirmation to be? And this actually work has never really been done well in America. We just all of a sudden started to do it. So in the Episcopal Church and then the Church of England, it's really local practice writ large. Uh, the bishop is supposed to sort of decide it for the diocese, but most bishops don't say anything about this mm -hmm. and sort of accede to local practice. Uh, but the West Indies is very slowly, very deliberately trying to, what do we understand happens at confirmation? What do we un understand happens in Holy Communion that would require confirmation as a prerequisite for receiving the body and blood of Christ? Um, now, well, hold up. Let's back up. Jesus did not require his disciples to go through communion, uh, confirmation, to receive the first communion. Uh, that was not something that was represented in any of the New Testament through Acts. That this is part of the uh, the Holy Communion, where you are baptized and have to receive confirmation. This is kind of something that mm -hmm. uh, the church has added to kind of make sure you understand what's happening here. And so in doing so, you know, I, it, it's more of a church tradition than I would say a biblical tradition. And in all fairness, yeah, I, ha I have never been to a church where the priest stood up and said, all Christians who have been confirmed and baptized may receive Holy Communion. I've always heard... Uh, especially in the Episcopal Church, if you're baptized in the ACNA churches, I've heard if you are a, if you are a Christian, a practicing Christian, and are baptized, you may receive Holy Communion. So. And to be perfectly honest, I have given communion to non-baptized people. I've had people who are members of the Salvation Army. 
Mm -hmm. and the Salvation Army does not practice the, the sacrament of baptism, but they will come forward. Uh, uh, and I do not repel them from the altar. Um, now, am I being, do I lack rigor in my theology? Well, most people say yes, <laughs> say but yes. Come on. <laughs> um, it really, uh, f for me, I had come from an evangelic perspective that if you do not have the faith uh, you, uh, when you receive the body and blood, you receive it vainly. Yes. You basically eat and drink vainly of the body and blood of Christ, and it avails you not. It's not the body and blood of Christ. It's just a stale cracker and some syrupy wine if you don't have faith. So, but it, I think this is a fascinating discussion, and I applaud the West Indian Church for having it because it's, it's the sort of thing that I think we would be wise to spend our time on rather than the transgender nonsense and yeah. all the it, junk it, that if, we get up to as denominations. If I were to have my, my choice of having a discussion on whether or not we should have drag queens in the sanctuary or whether or not we should have confirmation uh, before the Eucharist, I, I, would, I would like that discussion, you know? That, yeah, because that's, <laughs> because it's, not just, it's not just a sharpening of rules, it basically is a teaching element of what do we think is happening here mm -hmm. that we need to do X, Y, and Z. And that, I think, is more profitable for the life of the church than all this climate change nonsense yeah. uh, hysteria. Um, I'm not well, saying climate change is nonsense, I'm saying the hysteria within the church, you know, that, you know, Greta Thunberg uh, is eliminating her tweets from 2018 saying that in five years the world will be destroyed uh, because of climate change. You know, just move in the five years forward every every five years. But uh, Well, they finally took that's down... That's what hysteria. Th there's a sign at Glacier National Park that said uh, in 2020 the glacier here won't exist anymore. Well, it's still there. And so they finally had to mm -hmm. take down that sign. Uh uh, saying that the glacier should be gone. I mean, we is the climate changing? Yes. How much influence does the human have on climate change? We don't know yet. We haven't been here long enough to really measure that. But uh, I digress. This isn't a show about climate change. It's a show about what happens around the world in the church. Uh, we got a couple more stories we should handle. Uh, let's do a quick follow-up to the Tanzania election for a primate that was held a week ago or two weeks ago. The Gafcon guy has cried foul after a booted bishop got to vote in the election, George. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, um, Archbishop Mandola, Mandola mm -hmm. uh, was reelected by, uh, I think, 10 votes out of like 150-odd cast over Stanley Hote of Mount Kilimanjaro. And Matt Stanley was the sort of GAFCON favorite, and Mandola was sort of an isolationist, which is, I don't want to get involved in any of you people. Sure. And we, we jokingly said it, uh, Stanley was taking money from Christchurch Greenwich, which is a liberal American parish, uh, to support his campaign. Well, Stanley has cried foul because the Bishop of Zanzibar, Michael Hafid, voted in the election, and Michael Hafid is currently under suspension for misconduct. And Stanley is saying, well, because he voted, it taints the whole thing. Well, his critic, well, the other side is saying, well, it's only one vote, and you lost by 10 votes. Okay, you now lost by nine votes. And Stanley is saying, well, we can't say that because he, because he voted anyway, it taints the whole process. You got to throw out, you know, the one bad apple wrecks everything. So this will probably wind up in the courts with the, our, our friends in Tanzania say that the Tanzanian government loves peace in the churches. They do not like church fights, and they try to shut them down for in the name of civil and domestic order and tranquility. Thank God. So my guess is, <laughs> and so my guess is that at a certain point, the government's going to say to Stanley, knock it off, yeah. knock it off. You've lost, it's not going to change anything, but still, it, the Tanzanian election is still unsettled because of this legal challenge. All right. So what I think is the biggest story probably of the year so far is going to be the German Roman Catholic bishops have voted that they are going to do gay blessings. They're going to allow free female priests 
and other innovations we've seen in the Episcopal Church and the Church of England uh, are now going to be present in the German uh, province. Now, um, let's back uh, up. N- not okay. Not, Correct me where I'm wrong. Not pre. <coughs> Uh, not priests, uh, but they're allowing women to preach at the Eucharist, preach, which okay, they're Eucharist. not able to do. Okay, and they are encouraging women deacons. They're in okay. favor of women That's priests. True. They believe sure. that the ministry, they should believe it's the ministry should be open to mm-hmm. all people, but they're not going to just do it. But they are going to go ahead and do gay blessings. So, that one, they're but, not going to wait for any any pushback from Rome. They're going to go ahead and do it. Now, we could talk for five shows about the liberalization of the German church, you know, going back to the early 19th century, George, the, the German Lutherans, uh, and how that, that whole church and the seminaries there have just gone uh, woke before woke was a thing. Um, I think the most liberal seminaries I can think of exist uh, uh, within the landlock we call Germany. So, um, I'm not surprised this happened. Uh, in, in any way, shape, or form, that Germany is leading the way in the Roman Catholic Church on this. My point being is, I haven't heard anything from Pope Francis. Nothing. Uh, I, and I've listened. Yeah, I, it's- Rome, hello. <laughs> Very, very interesting. What's happening in the? They call it the synodical process. Mm-hmm. The German Church uh, has overwhelmingly voted in favor of, in, of as you mentioned, gay blessings, permitting divorced and remarried people to receive uh, the Eucharist, uh, uh, opening the ministry to all people, uh, raising the power of the laity and the life of the church. Essentially, the and essentially the church, the German Catholic Church, is recast itself into a German vision of the Episcopal Church or the Church of England, of that and at that liberal level. Really, there's not that much different now between the Catholic, German Catholic Church and the Episcopal Church in New York or in other places. Now, the German bishops have said they will go ahead and, in fact, they have already been blessing gay unions and they're just catching up to the facts on the ground and it's quite noticeable as you say that there has been no pushback from Rome now some German cardinals well the two German cardinals in Germany um, uh, one Cardinal Marx voted for it and the other one Cardinal Weiske Weiske, whatever he, he abstained Cardinal Mueller who's German in the Vatican said, no, 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 no. But he's not part of the bishop's conference because he's in Vat Rome based. And so he's crying bloody murder, but so far Francis is silent. The Belgian bishop's conference have already approved gay blessings, but they've said, we still have one guy who's not keen on it. And so until we're all unanimous, we're not gonna go ahead, but we've told Francis what we're doing. And Francis hasn't said, this is a problem. They told this to the German bishops. So, the, and the German bishops have not been sat on by Francis. So, for the Germans, it's saying, "Oh, we don't care what Cardinal Mueller says or what Cardinal Sarah says or all these arch conservatives." So, we're if, waiting for the Pope to tell us no. And the chances is that we're slim. But suppose the uh, German Roman Catholic bishop said, "Hey, we're going to have traditional Mass. We're going to have traditional Latin Mass in all our churches." The, the 7 a.m., 8 a.m. Mass is traditional Latin. Would we have heard from Pope Francis? Yes, you would have. Uh, I'm sure you would have been. But also, here's the thing. If the Germans can get away with this, okay. those traditional Latin Mass places where they've been told they can't do it, the bishop will mm-hmm. just say, well, we're going to do it anyway. Um, the... The Catholic Church is a, is at a real crossroads, it's, it, and essentially, though it's we're st- different issue, well, it's the same issue, but mm-hmm. it's presenting itself in a different way. But it's the issue of modernism, as they would say in Catholic circles, or the issue of postmodernism in uh, Protestant or Anglican circles, 
What is the nature of truth? Are there any eternal verities that are always and everywhere true for all times and in all people and all places? I can remember the late Frank Griswold saying, well, what is true in Lagos, Nigeria may be false in New York. Now, this goes back to Pontius Pilate's question, what is truth? And if truth is, as they now saying in Germany and in the American Episcopal Church, truth is a function of power, it's a function of uh, historical inevitability, um, I well, uh, how, how is this, this Marxist... Hmm? How is this any different than Gnosticism? There's no silent G uh, in it, but yes. apart from that. <laughs> I mean, I, the, we, we've, we're just rehashing old heresies. Um, I have not heard of a new heresy in, or read about a new heresy in probably 70 years. You know, this is, this is, this and, is the same old, same old. And he, one of the things that I think is fascinating is the, uh, the Ordinariate, which is was created by Benedict to allow Anglicans a, a safe home in Rome for traditionalists. The Ordinariate in the UK has banned Calvin Robinson from filming a Christmas, uh, an Easter show in one of their churches. They were going to allow him to do an Easter show to be televised on GB News. And the vicar of this church uh, had members of his choir saying that Calvin is a homophobe and is an arch conservative, and we won't be, we don't want him in the church. So the victor, vicar talked to the bishop, the ordinariate, who's a former Anglican bishop, and they both said, No, Calvin, you're too conservative for us. Uh, you're too, you're a homophobe and you're, you know, too much uh, anti woke. Friends, the ordinariate was the place for Catholic-minded Anglicans who were fighting the woke battles to go to. And now we hear the ordinariate in the Church of England is, is woke. Yeah. They, won't let, they won't let Calvin Robinson, after they had agreed to, but when mem gay members of the choir began to complain, you, you have to start and ask yourself, uh, what was the whole point of the ordinariate? Well, the point if, of the open, ordinary it was a response to mutual flourishing not working. Okay, when that died on the branch of the Church of England, uh, there, hey, come on over. You know, I, I have an ordinary, you can come over. It's an easy process. We stamp a few of your documents and boom, you're, you're on your way to be a priest in the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, that was well, it opens up fail. the door for yeah. all the uh, all the unkind things evangelicals have been saying for years. The ordinary it was the home for misanthropic homosexuals yeah. in the Church yeah. of England who <laughs> were happy with gay blessings but just didn't like women priests. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, was a terrible slander and all this and that. But the leaders of the ordinary are seeming to do their very best to make sure that these slanders stick. And that the ordinary it is no better than the German Catholic Church. They just don't like women. <sighs> or orthodoxy. Or sp <laughs> scripture. Or I mean, the list goes on. So, George, let's move on to our next <coughs> news story. We certainly beat that one to death. Um, just a quick topic check. Uh, we are still having follow-up to Isabel von Spruce's interview uh, we conducted here on, on Scripted about two or three episodes ago. Two or three episodes ago. If you've not seen it, you got to see it. It talks about what you and I know as a thought crime and prayer crime, and uh, uh, certainly the re-envision of George Orwell's 1984 on the shores of the UK. Um, Senator Chip Roy has sent a letter to the State Department in regards to Isabel von Spruce saying, we need to investigate England for persecuting Christians. Well, Chip Roy is a congressman. Uh, from He's not mine, so I just pulled, okay, I just pulled that out there. So, okay, Representative he, Chip Roy. Yeah, yeah. Yes, he, he his district includes Kerrville, parts of San Antonio, that sort of central area of Texas. 
New Braunfels. Okay. Chip Roy, along with six other uh, Republican congressmen, have signed a letter uh, to the U.S. State Department's International Religious Freedom Envoy saying you really need to look into this Isabel von Spruce and the persecution of Christians, uh, street preachers, all the things that Christian concern, one of our friends' ministries who are fighting the persecution of Christians in the workplace, the persecution of Christians in public square, uh, the these anti-prayer things, because uh, these violate the American understanding of religious freedom. And we're asking you, U.S. State Department, to tell us, has England, be, does England need to be a, now a country of particular concern? Maybe not like North Korea, but, but maybe are like you sure? some other places. <laughs> This is, this I think is remarkable. Well, what's going to happen? Nothing's going to happen. Uh, somebody will do a paper in three or four years. They'll come back and and nobody will remember what it said. And this is what congressmen do do. They make little splashes. They tie themselves to items in the news. But it is telling that the uh, uh, now if we had a different administration, Donald Trump, uh, if he were president. Donald Trump, when he met with the Nigerian president, uh, uh, took him to task over the predations of Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. It depends on the guy in charge. And he basically told the Nigerians, get your act together and no military aid. Joe Biden couldn't care less. That's not part of his administration's uh, worldview or agenda. So we're happy, clappy with the Nigerian government. and We remove them as a country of concern over Christian persecution. Uh, if uh, we had a different administration, they might say to the British Prime Minister, "What is this? What is this stuff that you're doing? How can you, how can you hold your head up as a Western nation speaking out for democracy and freedom, when you are persecuting people in your own country?" Well, our current government, as it exists, is not going to push that button. So that's why these Cong Republican congressmen are doing it. But nonetheless, I think it is embarrassing uh, for Britain. Well, maybe not. I don't know if they care. I don't think they yeah. I think, you know, as we've discussed, their uh, idea of what the, the church is there for is different than ours. But it's interesting because the uh, oh. European Union um, has laws that are even harder, uh, hardly enforced, but uh, harder against uh, persecution for Christians. They protect Christian um, identity more than the UK laws. And it's hard to, to see this because we know the trajectory if we let this go uh it will just continue on in a worse fashion uh, the christians don't care if we persecute no big deal well it it's the if i were english an englishman i would be particularly upset not because some republican congressman from texas says something bad not a senator. rather the not a senator not but rather the image i have of britain being a special place of a place that you know has done so much to bring light and peace and civilization to the world is that britain is being lost so that our police so that my, the police in the uk are more interested in in arresting elizabeth von spruce than they are in solving crime where uh Muslim a uh, Quran can be could be uh, accidentally uh, wrecked by a an autistic boy in a school and all these death threats made against the boy and it's the boy who is investigated by the police not the death threats mm -hmm. against him uh, this is a recent case that was in the news in Britain um, where that sense of being British that sense of Englishness that pride that heritage all that it has stood for is being wiped slowly erased in favor of this bland sort of down market tony blair cool britannia image which has but not worn itself well you're right there i mean for all intents and purposes woke uh and certainly the last generation has made it a point to erase the magna carter to erase you know the ability for uh people to be protected from the government and the, you know Isabel von Spruce is a perfect example of that she is no longer protected from the government she's no longer protected from the church her protections are gone 
for conducting a silent prayer on a street inside a buffer zone. Uh, something completely unreal to us is now you know, a dystopian society. Uh, the the become the, and it's not just the UK. It's it's Europe. It's it's certainly here in North America. Um, you know that magnificent document Magna Carta means nothing anymore. We are not protected from our government, our kings. Mm -hmm. You know. So, all right. Final story. We got ten minutes to wrap this up. Uh, the Barna Group put out a poll, and they say the American uh, the state of the American Protestant clergy is dire. And uh, just a, a quick example, in 2015, 72% of priests, pastors um, within the Western Church here were satisfied with their job. In 2022, only 50% were satisfied. And your priest, you can probably uh, tell me a little bit more about this. Uh, COVID was hard. COVID uh, ruined the idea of what it meant to be a priest. Uh, uh, in many people's minds, peace, as say priest and pastor, and it's reflected in these numbers. But I think we also saw the cancel culture come up in COVID times. There's not, it's not just COVID. You know, it's, it's kind of what I see here in the West. It's the Christians have lost the benefit of the doubt. The Christians are now being persecuted and canceled here in the West. And there was COVID too. And that's why the satisfaction with the job is really uh, taking a hit. In my opinion, George, you could tell me more. Yeah, the Barna Group has done a series of tests about the mental and emotional health of the clergy for a number of years. And mm -hmm. their report is that things are dire. And that, uh, as you mentioned, 72% were very satisfied with the very uh, mm -hmm. in there. Uh, with their ministry in uh, 2015, that's down, down to 52% in 2022. And among those under the age of 45, only 35% are very satisfied, which is quite frightening when you think about it, because the clergy for the next 30 years, mm -hmm. that block, uh, only one in three is very satisfied with their work. The other statistic I saw was that two in five pastors have thought about quitting the ministry in the past year. Now, this all smacks me as being true. The emotional stresses, the spiritual stresses from COVID have been tremendous. Um, part of it may be that I know in the Episcopal Church, there's no sense that anybody has your back. There's no sense that, you know, nobody's asked me from the Diocese of the National Church how I'm doing or what can we do, you know, nothing, nothing like that. So I'm on my own. Um, I only see clergy colleagues at convention once a year and maybe a deanery meeting once every six months. So, you know, we're really on our own. We're congregationalists for all intents and purposes. And there's no backup. And then when we do hear bishops talk, it's talk about, you know, the nonsense. We've discussed this already, the transgenderism and climate change. Yeah. The other thing yeah. I think is so very hard is that in dealing with people in the congregation, we're, I'm saying, I don't want to say it's a walking away of faith, but the people who are here four Sundays a month are now here three Sundays. And the people who are three Sundays are here two Sundays. And the people who are here two Sundays are here one Sunday. And the one Sunday a month, people only show up now Christmas and Easter. They fell out of the practice of going to church. Now different congregations may have different experiences, but I'm still my eight o'clock service is back where it was. In fact, it's doing better than pre-COVID. 10.30, I'm still missing 50 people. And I'm writing to people and I'm asking them how they're doing and where they are. And I'm getting little cards back saying, oh, we're fine, thanks. In fact, I have one on my desk right here that basically says, uh, we're happy as we are right now. What does that mean? Yeah. They're gone. They've floated away. Um, you know, of course, I can pray. I continue to pray for people, but yeah. it's very hard to try to expand your church when your core is basically saying, eh, "It's not really for us." Yeah, 
Now, of and, course, there will be exceptions, but what we're seeing across the Protestant world are the experiences I'm having, according to the Barna Group. Mm -hmm. And that's reflecting yeah. it, and people are saying, oh my goodness, this is maybe I'm in the wrong business. Maybe I should sell aluminum siding. Maybe I should start over again. Now, I'm going to tell you, you know, something you probably know. I saw this in the ACNA as well. I know a person who's head of a deanery. Um, how do I say this without identifying the location? In a place where there's hard ground. I don't want to give any geological information because uh, this person can be pinpointed too easily. But he expresses the same thing you do. He said, you know, almost the entire deanery is full of depressed priests. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, he's there to encourage them and to hear their stories and talk to them. But, it, you know, it's very hard to be a priest in 2020, 2021, and 2022 and into 23 because of all the different challenges that are presented other than just being the hard ground. Um, and mm -hmm. that is trying to uh, restart a church after COVID, uh, restart a church after lo live streaming it for so long, restart a church to get people who have lost the habit. The habit was very important. The I, My Sunday's mornings are set aside for the worship of my Lord, to go to church and to worship, because that's going to be the sum total of my week. I'm going to continue it into Monday and into Tuesday, and for the rest of the week, through the prayer book and for the morning prayer and the afternoon prayer and the evening prayer, I'm going to continue that because that is my habit. COVID wiped out everyone's habit, including mm -hmm. the priest. And there's also a tendency in Christian circles for some people to start at this point loudly shouting, well, my church is doing great. Mm -hmm. And essentially shame the person who is speaking from their heart that things are difficult by pointing out how wonderful things are for them that far from being helpful is destructive and pushes that well maybe i'm in the wrong line here yeah maybe i'm just doing things wrong in other words trump trumpeting a success while everybody else is having a hard time is rather vulgar on one level but also doesn't speak to why people are having trouble. It's not by the quantity of prayers being offered up. It's not by the, because there are excellent clergy who have really terrible uh, attendance problems right now. And you cannot say that, oh, well, if you only did this, that, and the other, things would turn around. It's, it's not my, I think we're at the point now, we've been in this long enough, we're seeing this is not merely a, problem of return on our investment or time but rather we're facing a very big spiritual battle that we've not had to face in this way before or at least that's my experience mm -hmm. yeah yeah this is uncharted ground uh in our short history okay now there's uh certainly clergy who've gone through world wars uh where their country has fought in another country and their uh, laity was in a trench on the front line. This is a little different. This is where the whole world had to reset because uh, of a virus that had uh, you know, a mort mortality rate beyond what we were prepared for. And in as such, there was this, this entire fear factor for the whole world. And there was this, this oh, it just give us two weeks and we can stop the virus. And this this kind of broke down our mentality because two weeks became four weeks, became two months, became half a year, became three years. Now, for all intents and purposes, uh, COVID and all its variants are no longer deadly. Um, they're no longer breakouts around the country. Uh, it still happens to one degree or another, but that is over. Will the church return to the way it was? Now, I know lots of church plants that are doing just great because they kind of started right after COVID and they got a great spark going. Um, but for those churches that existed before COVID, those parishioners, as I've said before, have lost that habit. And how do you re restore it? One thing is, I'm going to say this is wait it out a little. You know, um, mm -hmm. uh, especially, you know, in our, in our demographic here in Florida, it's a little older. 
I think waiting it out is going to be the way forward. But we don't know. I mean, so many people I meet have just taken up to traveling full time and have relocated mm -hmm. full time. Um, it's just, you know, astonishing what COVID has allowed us to do remotely and enjoy our time more. Uh, it's, you know, ruined the economy, of course. But um, I, I don't have a long term answer for this, other though we just went over time. Hey, George. <laughs> What a great show. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 795 of Anglican Unscripted.